as we've discussed, we're, we're here to, to, to celebrate uh, National School Choice Week uh, here in North Carolina. Uh, as I shared earlier, uh, when we talk nationally, we are a state uh, that, that's really, I believe, uh, kind, of, kind of leading, leading the pack. Uh, that being said, and, and again, I, I think all too often, I, I think we as those who believe in parental school choice, we probably linger too long of, 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 of pumping the pom-poms and, and doing the cheers around parental school choice, and, and we kind of leave it there. But, but uh, we thought we'd take a, a, a portion of this program to really kind of give a snapshot. When you talk about parental school choice, beyond just the traditional public school system. Yeah, we've grown, but, but a lot of that growth, and one of the reasons I wanted to acknowledge some of our elected officials here, a lot of that growth has really happened here in North Carolina over the last five to six years. When you, when you talk about public charter school expansion, that's 2012. Since 2012, we've had 70%, over 70% growth uh, in public charter schools in the state of North Carolina. Now, again, we were at 100 uh, for about 15 years, 1996. So again, we we're already almost close to doubling that uh, within a very, very truncated period of time. Uh, we talked about private education. Expansion of that, really, in a lot of ways, particularly for working class poor since 2012, when our very first special needs uh, uh, program, opportunity scholarship program, came on after that. Virtual public charter school, that's actually within the last couple of years. Um, uh, and you'll learn a little bit more about that. And then don't, we can never forget who I say to you has really got the real skin in the game when you talk about parental school choice, and that's homeschoolers. Uh, we talked about the fact that over 50,000 households in North Carolina educate their children at home, and that's well over 120,000 kids and, and, and growing. We're a leader in the nation in that. Of all the options, including traditional public school days of going, homeschool has the highest enrollment each and every year in our state. North Carolina is one of the leaders in the growth of, of, of homeschool. And, and so again, uh, for the vast majority of our growth is really taking place in the last five to six years. And a lot of the women uh, and, and gentlemen uh, that are our state senators, state representatives, are, are, have, have been on the front charge of, of, of really opening up the door uh, for, for opportunities. To help us engage this discussion uh, fully, we've invited the following distinguished guests and experts to help us kind of dig into this a little bit more. Uh, so I'd like to take this time to just introduce them. Uh, to my left is Dr. Thomas Miller. Uh, he runs the, the gamut. I mean, this guy is, a, is an educator, uh, he's an administrator. Um, uh, he worked in the Office of, of Public Charter School. In fact, he had a real critical role, probably one of the reasons why he's no longer there, when his expansion came, you know, and all these applications come flooded in. Uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, uh, Tom Miller took a very strategic role, ladies and gentlemen, in really helping leadership establish a ready-to-open process, and much of that is still intact today. Uh, uh, since that time, he's launched uh, Leaders Building Leaders, uh, his own company, and he, uh, he happens to, to be kind of uh, lead the charge what we call the North Carolina Public Charter School Accelerator uh, here in North Carolina, which was launched by our organization in uh, 2012 to equip educational leaders with tools to design effective educational programs, strengthen community partnerships in order to start and sustain high quality public school, public charter schools in rural and academically challenges, challenging communities. Uh, just this week, uh, we, we traveled across the state here, uh, highlighting a number of those schools, primarily in those rural areas that have really done a, a great job. Uh, Dr. Tom Miller uh, received his National Board of Certification as an as exceptional children's educator. Uh, for New Hanover County, et cetera. So we could not have uh, a stronger uh, expert here uh, to kind of talk here in an area of public charter schools. To his left, Karen DeCat currently serves as Executive Director for the Southeast, uh, Southeast Connection Education, where she oversees eight states, not just one state, but eight states. Education is accredited provider of, 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 of Connection Education is accredited provider of high quality, high accountable virtual education solutions for students in K-12. Prior to joining the Big Boy Connections company, she worked with Little Parents for Education. <laughs> and she said, Daryl, you ain't paying me enough. I'm working too hard. Let me go take it to another level. And I need a couple more, more of my nation. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, I'm still getting up for that, Karen. 
<laughs> but uh, she's she formerly worked at Civitas. Um, she's pretty experienced working. Again, she's a heavy hitter. She worked at Capitol Hill. She worked closely with one of the most prominent uh, U.S. Senators, uh, Grassley. She attended law school at Catholic University of America in D.C. and attended uh, uh, Chap UNC Chapel Hill undergrad. To her left is Julia Adams Shurich. She's CEO and Director of Government Relations for a newly formed lobbying company, Oak City Government Relations. Oak City is dedicated to working with the uh, disability community in North Carolina by providing strong uh, representation for their issues at the North Carolina General Assembly. Uh, Ms. Adams, and that's what I like to call her, is ranked as one of the most influential lobbyists in North Carolina by nonpartisan North Carolina Center for Public uh, Policy Research. Um, I can go on and on, but let me just tell you, when it comes to special needs and disability in the state of North Carolina, uh, it's, to me it's Julia Adams uh, uh, and her close network here, Julia, uh, Jennifer Mahan is here, and then, and then kind of everybody else. Uh, a real go-to, very passionate, has a very strong personal story, so she really believes personally uh, what she professes uh, uh, professionally. And so uh, when it comes to really insights in this area here, that community, uh, we're so happy to have you here, uh, Julia. And last but not least, Allison Gunther. Uh, she is Parents for Educational Freedom in North Carolina State Outreach Director. Uh, in that capacity, she directs uh, strat strategic outreach to schools, parents, to ensure that they are familiar with various school choice options, uh, educating how, how to navigate uh, uh, but, uh, participation in state programs and ensuring that their voices are heard uh, uh, in the public uh, for, for our decision makers. Her career has been spent uh, focused on underserved, vulnerable populations, having worked to increase awareness across um, to, to child uh, 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 <clears throat> maltreatment programs that prevent child abuse in North Carolina and representing the interests of agriculture, rural North Carolina, uh, and NC State. Um, uh, she's a proud, very proud uh, NC State uh, wolf pack. Don't let the, the good looks fool you. She is a competitor. And boy, she was walking, literally walking on air. Uh, about three days ago, three nights ago, when, when NC State uh, broke that curse of about 22 years uh, and beaten Duke uh, uh, there. So, so we're, we're very happy. Uh, and you all join me in uh, welcoming my fellow. So I'm going to have Tom uh, uh, kind of start um, start the discussion. We'll roll down the list here, uh, kind of giving us Tom a kind of a, a, a brief overview of your subject of interest. Uh, and then after uh, that, each each two of you all take about two minutes to kind of give a, kind of an overview. We'll follow up with with some questions here for me to you guys. But two minutes on the clock. Thanks, Daryl. Well, if I could real quick, if everybody could give Mr. Allison a round of applause too, because a lot of you guys. You know, charter schools uh, is a huge interest of mine. I was a charter school educator, a charter school school leader. I wrote my dissertation on the effective characteristics of charter schools. I know you've all read it. Um, <laughs> so I just live and read you know, charter schools every day because it has such an entrepreneurial spirit on a daily basis. And But that really comes down to leadership. So when you know, Daryl asked me about the strengths, it really comes down to the leadership capabilities of not only the original idea person, but the person who, who can execute, you know, behind him that, you know, mission and continue to go uh, forward. And that's what we see the most. Everything rises and falls with leadership, so my interest is always in the leadership. So we work specifically with the principal and the governing boards to make sure that they have the skills and they're equipped uh, to make great long-term decisions, because as you'll see, unfortunately, most of our charter schools, because they don't have their capital uh, you know, monies or other aspects, they, they sometimes make bad decisions from the get-go just to get their school open, and then they're in a constant catch-up mode. Strength-wise, um, just, just the innovation part, are we talking about the strengths of charters too here? So we'll get to the SWAT. Right. I just want to give an overview, uh, an overview um, of your subject area. I'm going to give Karen more time because she deserves it. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for this opportunity. Um, well, again, thank you to Civitas and Parents for Educational Freedom being on the staff of both. I know it's a lot of work to put something like this together, so kudos to you all and, and all the staff and leadership there as well. Um, but virtual education, so if school choice is a redheaded stepchild, virtual education is the, red <laughs> I would say is the, is the red haired stepchild of school choice. It's such a um, very specific topic and a um, just a lot of area where people are unaware of what's going on or, or what it is and what it isn't. 
Um, but virtual education is, it kind of covers the entire spectrum um, when it comes to supplementing the current um, options out there. So even in traditional districts, a lot of um, districts will partner with someone like Connections Education or other providers to supplement, let's say, an AP Chinese course that a really um, accelerated learner needs. Or maybe someone needs credit recovery and they need time to catch up. That's where virtual education can fit into those areas. All the way up to um, the full-time option. And just recently, thanks to many legislators in this room, um, there were two virtual charter schools that were approved for a four-year pilot, and CVA being one of them, which is also here, and North Carolina Connections Academy. We also have a board member from NCCA here, so thank you, Bridget, for being here. And she's, a, she's a parent, so she's very invested in this option. Um, and through the pilot program um, in North Carolina, it has really opened up an option to roughly about 1% of students in any state. Um, that's where you kind of see this full-time option being the most um, successful option for them. And it can range from someone who has been bullied, someone who is homebound because of medical reasons, all the way up to someone who, let's say, plays ball all over the country, um, and they need that option to have a flexible schedule, um, to someone who's behind and needs extra time to catch up. Being in a virtual setting allows them to do that. Sure. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for um, inviting me to be here today to talk. Um, I actually am a lobbyist, so please don't throw anything at me up. Uh, but I come from um, the advocacy background. I am a woman with a disability who runs her own company. Um, and I have experienced both the positive effects in my own education background of private school as well as public school. Uh, my parents made a choice to put me in public school and then move me to private um, because of my disability and then move me back into public when they had no other choice. Um, I also come at this as the very proud stepmother of a wonderful young man who has run the whole spectrum of educational opportunities in the state of North Carolina. My son, uh, Ethan Shurik, um, has high-functioning autism, ADHD, oppositional defiance disorder, anxiety and depression. And we were in the public school system and we had an IEP and we tried really hard. And what we ended up doing is actually using the scholarship that I helped to pass with the incredible support of so many legislators in this room. We were able to put him in a private school for a year and then we were able to pull him out of that and using connections as a virtual platform for our son homeschool him for a year to give him ABA therapy for his autism in an intensive manner inside our house. And now he's back in public school with an IEP and has a 4.0 GPA. But he cannot, thank you, I'm very proud of him. But he cannot have been that successful unless his parents, myself and his father, had options and had choice and were able to access all of these programs from virtual schools, to scholarships, to IEPs, and we're allowed the flexibility to really educate Ethan uh, in this process. Allison? Good afternoon. As Bob mentioned earlier, we had to expand the room, so I'm really glad that all of you are here with us. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background on the Opportunity Scholarship Program, that program was put into place by the legislature in 2013. That program allows for working class families, low income families, to access private education through scholarships worth up to $4,200 a year. Uh, this has really opened up the doors of opportunity for so many families who wanted something different for their kids, but didn't know how to get there. Uh, this scholarship um, has allowed uh, around 6,000 kids this year to access private education, whereas they would have never had that option uh, before. And as we look forward, we thank a lot of folks around the room who helped to expand this program. I'll talk a little bit about that further as we go along, but we're gonna see an extreme amount of growth in that program as parents finally have more options available to them through the Opportunity Scholarship. Great, great. And so I, I think we now shift into a real um, uh, wonderful part here. And again, really appreciate uh, those of you in the room. But I'm also preface this, uh, as well. Uh, we, we, in the room, uh, we have media, uh, we have members of the General Assembly that you know, may be warm uh, to some options, may be cool to, to others, uh, and we also have organizations. Uh, 
uh, right, that um, uh, um, uh, maybe take more of a, a less enthusiastic approach <laughs> uh, to permanent school choice than many of us here, but I'm glad we're all in the room. I'm glad we're all in the room because, again, I thought this would be a wonderful opportunity to have individuals who are really strong in the area, have good expertise in its specific areas of a parental school choice, that for us to really take a moment uh, to really see where we are, uh, let's expound upon uh, uh, and be able to also kind of talk candidly uh, about where we are. Uh, I, I think we're really uh, just started in a lot of ways. Uh, we've seen tremendous uptake uh, in, in a lot of ways here, but I think we're not too far down the path uh, that we can't reevaluate, take a moment to see how we can make things stronger uh, and not just <laughs> counter uh, to, to those individuals who are not thinking the way we are to just label it well they're partisan or label you know that they're part of the traditional public school establishment that's what they're paid to do no I, I think we need to really take it all in uh, uh, you know cut the fat right you know the stuff that's kind of uh, where we are but also we as parental school choice supporters and things of that nature really evaluate and we'll really look in the mirror now don't squint uh, really look in that mirror stay there uh, and, and deal with uh, things that you know, we all want to deal with. I'll be very candid, as I'll say. We're, we're not just an organization. Our organization is not just an organization. It's just about options more and more and more. We want to make sure that the options that we have on the table are the highest of quality options. And, uh, and I think in order to really get there, it takes all of us uh, to work to try to make sure that for that parent, whether it's traditional, non-traditional, uh, the options that they have of the highest quality and that really they're having a hard time choosing good good or better i think that's what we really want to want to do here so um, uh, we're going to give each of our um, uh, panelists an opportunity to kind of <coughs> dig into this a bit about four minutes here to dig into this where they're going to kind of give us their swat analysis i mean you're all most of you all are familiar with that we want to talk about our strengths uh, talk about, uh, in your area of expertise, what are the strengths that you see in terms of growth or otherwise in the programs that you, 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 you support? We want to talk about the weaknesses. We must acknowledge the problems that we face. What are the weaknesses uh, that, that, that you see? Let's talk about the opportunities, uh, opportunities that have been tapped or untapped. Uh, and then lastly, just really envision and really discuss those, those threats there. And so the opportunity is we're going to kick it off to Dr. Tom Miller. Each of them will take their time to kind of work through that, uh, the kind of SWOT analysis. And then we should have a little bit of uh, time at the end to answer a couple of questions, give a couple of questions for those of you you in, in the audience. But, uh, you know, uh, please make note because we want to we have them kind of get through theirs. And then, again, we can, we can ask, uh, ask and answer some questions at the end. But I think it would be, I think it'd be good, good, um, good discussion here. Without further ado, Dr. Tom Miller. Great. Thanks, Daryl. Um, you know, I would say, uh, as most of you know, your greatest uh, strength is also your blind spots, right? So it's so you may hear me, you know, bounce back and forth a couple of times when it comes to uh, you know, charter schools in North Carolina. Um, I would say one of the greatest strengths, number one, is that you know charter schools have to do with more with less, and they are doing more with less. Uh, they don't get the same amount of funding per child locally or statewide. You know, don't get capital money. You hear that all the time. That's not an excuse. That's just what they agreed to do. So they exchange that like autonomy. So you know, strength-wise, if, if if you have a moment, just go right across the street. It's 100 yards away. Explorers uh, Charter School, right here. It's the number one STEM public school in North Carolina. It's a charter school, um, and and they uh, they have. Uh, this amazing looping model, a co-teaching model. 97 organizations have come to visit Explorers, not only from North Carolina, from across the globe, to see how they're getting things done. And they're doing it with less. You know, they're in this tiny little um, you know, building right there. And, and so it's, 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 it's ideas and strengths and opportunities like that that allow leadership uh, to make great decisions to, to put the people in the right positions to make those decisions, to get those partnerships with China and uh, Germany. And we saw one just you know, yesterday out at uh, Fernleaf, which is in Henderson County, where if you talk about an opportunity, a landowner who just had land that was sitting there and the city for years was trying to get it to do something with it, the charter school came around, he said, I'm gonna give it to them. 
they use the land to to use as as, as like some equity on the loan on the on the building, and now they have this great opportunity to stretch and expand their school. And they had, I think, they said 500 students on their wait list after year one. That's unheard of. That doesn't that does not occur in uh, first year charter schools. So as a whole, we know charter schools, 40% of them uh, scored an A plus A or B. Okay, so 40%. So of the 160 schools, that's you know roughly 62 schools. And can you practice what you mean by A plus? Sure. Sorry, so on the, on, the, on the report card, on the North Carolina Accountability Report Card. So that's great, we, you know, we, we, we want to see schools achieving. Um, so we saw more A's and more B's. Uh, we also don't see, uh, there's more F's of public charter schools. And one of the main reasons is that um, is, is, is really because of the you know, makeup of the school happens. Um, it takes time to get these schools uh, to where they need to be. Uh, I'm really excited because I looked this morning of the 62 schools that took the test last year that have opened since the elimination of the cap, 18 of them got an A plus A or B on the report card. So they're making a difference in, in the, you know, the areas and they're making promises. Now, um, with that, again, it takes a long time to get better uh, and it takes the resources and all those other pieces. And usually the first resource that gets kicked out of your budget is professional development. Um, so we see that as a great weakness and opportunity, uh, you, know, you know, both, yeah, you know, weaknesses, we don't have the funding for professional development, but the opportunity is um, we can partner with organizations that can help you know, bring that. So through, through our program uh, uh, with the Accelerator, we have partnered with the Hill Center, um, who has uh, provided professional development um, through their literacy programs, through multiple charter schools. They had no partnerships with charter schools before 2014, and now they have them with four schools. So you know, that's a great weakness, but opportunity. The weakness is we don't have the funding for the professional development, but the opportunity is we can gain some of those partnerships. Another area of you know, weakness for the state is just a lack of oversight. And when I say oversight, in the sense of what are charter schools actually responsible for? With 2,300 uh, traditional public schools and only 167 charter schools. The DPI and uh, 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 you know legislation rules are really written for those 2,300 schools. So there's a lack of clarity, and schools get themselves in a bad situation because they either don't know what they're supposed to be reporting on, or don't have the you know bandwidth to actually you know uh, get that done. So that's one thing that's a certain it's a threat uh, to uh, uh, you know charter schools across the state because they just don't necessarily have that. I'm so sorry. Did you time yourself? Is that what you did? <laughs> so, anyway, I'll wrap up there. ESPN, that you, you had on <laughs> oh, that, was pretty, that was pretty good there. That was pretty good. But I thought there. the sound was awesome. All right, all right, all right, all right. So, Karen, you get? Um, so I'm just going to go over some of the strengths and weaknesses first of virtual education. So as I said earlier, virtual education is meant to complement or fill the gaps where other school options maybe can't do that. Um, and so, again, it's an entire spectrum of opportunity. There's you know, just that one-off class that maybe you're in a rural area, and um, but for partnering with someone who can provide you a virtual, um, a virtual course, you won't have that opportunity. Um, all the way down to someone who is ex significantly behind and needs that opportunity to catch up. But it's also for children like Julia mentioned, children with disabilities, um, who maybe need to go at a different pace, and when they were moved from a traditional school system, a lot of those barriers are now gone. Some of the things that they needed in a traditional setting are no longer there. There's not those distractions. They don't need to be in a separate room, etc. cetera. Um, so that, I would say that that is something that may be also um, a weakness in that it's a lack of awareness of what virtual education really is. Um, it can help homeschoolers who want to take advantage of um, children with disabilities tax credit. It can be for private schools who need a couple of courses to supplement their current offerings. Um, all the way up to the full-time option with the, in North Carolina, the two public charter, virtual public charter schools that we have. For example, in North Carolina Connections Academy, um, it's run by a nonprofit board that then works with Connections Education to provide their curriculum, um, some of their teaching services. But it, in NCCA, you get the full school experience. You may be from at home, but there is attendance tracking, there is a teacher checking in with you very regularly, there is a learning coach, which is often the parent, but not always. Um, but it's the teacher that's teaching the child, not the learning coach. So the learning coach is there to be supportive. Um, the spectrum kind of ranges from an elementary school, the learning coach obviously is going to have to be more hands-on, um, and there's not a lot of screen time, 
all the way up to high school, where maybe they're spending more time on the screen or have more digital books, but they're able to advance at their own level pretty quickly without the need much of a learning coach. But there's special education <coughs> services, so testing sites. Um, if you want to talk about threats or, or weaknesses, one of the things is just the funding level for virtual charter schools. Um, you know, there are sometimes up to 10 testing sites throughout the state, and unfortunately, due to the current relationship with a lot of the school districts, um, the schools are forced to use, you know, public ballrooms, um, civic centers, things like that to do their testing. They have to get all of their teachers out there or other certified people that are allowed to do testing, meet all special education accommodations, which is quite a lot, as you all, as you all know from the disability world. Um, so that stuff can really add up, as well as just the local funding um, that is capped for virtual charter schools versus, you know, it's already low enough for, for our traditional public charter schools, it's, it can be even lower for our virtual charter schools. So there's a lot of expenses. Um, you know, honestly, just the, um, the boxes that these children get at the beginning of every year with the technology that's provided to anyone that would qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, they have box opening parties on YouTube where you can, you can actually see all the manipulatives that they're given, um, art supplies, if they're in a science class, they actually receive sometimes a telescope and other things. So it's really cool and it's truly a school environment. And I think that's one of the misconceptions as well as opportunities out there is to spread the, the word about what virtual education is um, and, what it, and what it isn't. And so obviously I think probably one of the greatest opportunities that NCCA and I'm sure can't speak for NCBA, but I'm sure um, they would support this as becoming a permanent option. So allowing virtual charter schools to be a permanent option in North Carolina is going to be important. There is strong demand every year. The schools are currently capped. Um, for NCCA, for example, it can only grow um, by 20% every year. And because it's not a K-12 school yet, um, it's currently serving K-10, sometimes that means families are displaced. So if there is a family that would like to have a child, and because of the caps, if there's a child, um, if there's two students, and one of them, you know, both of them would like to attend, unfortunately that's not always the case, and then you get into messing with family, um, and you know, how are they gonna get to two different schools at once? Um, just the different curriculums and the different schedules and stuff can be overwhelming. So we'd like to see that as a, as a permanent option as well as the funding. Those are our biggest areas where we'd like to see opportunity and growth. So I wanna follow up, so Karen, um, this, this option, uh, virtual public charter schools, uh, has been in existence since? It just finished its first year, and it's, they're in their second year. And how many s total students are in u utilizing that option? North Carolina Action Academy currently is capped at 1,800. 1,800. And it stays more or less at that level um, due to the fact that it is a very fluctuating population who may need it for a semester mm -hmm. or only a year. Um, it tends to be anywhere from 1,750 to 1,800 the entire, the entire year. And what would be your grade in terms of um, because you know you don't know till you know like what would be your what 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 challenge did you you all um, kind of it surprised you uh, since implementing we all know when you're starting something new you, you think you know what you're going to you know you expect but then what what would you say has been the biggest challenging or surprise challenge sure. in, in getting this off the ground. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I would say it's twofold. One is explaining what a virtual charter is because you do have families that maybe want to attend um, who are very into homeschooling, and you have to explain to them, well, this is a, this is a public charter school. There's going to be state assessments. There's going to be check-ins. If you have an IEP, that's going to be implemented. Um, and some parents are just looking to do their completely own thing, which is absolutely fine, and they have the right to do so. It's just that NCCA may not be the right opportunity for them. Um, but I would say um, another barrier is that just getting the word out there that, it, one, it was their first year in existence, um, and two, the entire student population is brand new. And not just brand new, but brand new to virtual education as well. And when you've got 100% of your students, um, there's study after study proving that they're not going to do as well as they do the longer they stay there. Um, and so we're really excited about some of the things NCCA has implemented to improve every area of the school. and. We'll, we we're really hoping for, for uh, good results in the second year. Great, great, thank you. Julia? So um, for those of you who don't know how the Special Needs Scholarship got to where it is today, um, it started out as a tax credit bill and it had bipartisan support. And the idea was that we needed to really take a look at some parents who had come to us, and this was a parent-driven bill. So parents came to organizations like the ARCA North Carolina and the Autism Society of North Carolina 
and other disability advocacy groups and asked us to assist them in moving forward something that would allow them to take their child from the public school system and put them into a private school and receive some funding to support that private school. Well, when we got started, we realized that it was more than just private school options that were required. We really needed to look at how could we do homeschooling and support parents who wanted to homeschool their child with disabilities. How could we craft a bill and craft a program that would really address children with the most significant disabilities in our state? Um, and so to qualify for the program, you need an IEP or need to be qualified to receive an IEP, which is an individual education plan in the state of North Carolina. It's a federally uh, recognized under the IDEA laws. And that allowed us to really target students who um, often are in classrooms where they may not be able to receive all the support services, especially when you look outside your metropolitan areas. When you're looking at your rural, your far rural west, your far rural east, where maybe they, they have all best intentions, but they need more support and they can't get it. I think one of the strengths has been, as that moved from a tax credit program into a scholarship program, what we saw was really good education across the board with legislative support on how this was integral to special education. Um, I also think one of the strengths of the program has been that as we continued on, we made really good tweaks to it. For example, um, you no longer have to have a full-fledged IEP meeting, which takes a lot of time and effort from the public school system. You just have to go through the process to qualify. Um, we also um, have other people now who can do educational reauthorization for the parents, as opposed to going back to the public school and having to use their resources. I think one of the weaknesses, honestly, is the funding source. Every single year, one of us has to fight to get more money to address growing wait lists. We have about 500 students on wait lists for this program, and that is a concern. I think the other weakness is when you look at the overall needs of a child with a disability, 4,000 per semester probably is not enough. And it's not enough in many ways because what I've seen a lot of parents do with this program is they may be able to pay part of the tuition themselves and then they split this scholarship to provide other academic supports or other social supports or speech therapy or occupational therapy or or some type of ABA therapy if your child has autism. I do think we have an excellent opportunity, and I would be really remiss to not say it today, um, since today is the rollout day, but as of today, North Carolina has opened up their ABLE Act program. So as of today, our state is now ABLE ready, as we say. So parents now have this other option. For those of you not familiar with ABLE, it's a 529A savings account. Um, you can put funding in it for your child with a disability without affecting any of their Medicaid services or their Social Security Disability Services, but it can be used for educational opportunities as well. So I think this is an opportunity to really start educating our legislators um, on the need to expand that scholarship and to move that, that bracket up financially uh, for the, from, from 4000 4, a semester, but also how would this help parents if we could co-educate or intersectionally educate on how to also use the ABLE Act accounts that became available to our, our state today. Thank you. Allison? Sure. We look at the Opportunity Scholarship and the strengths that we see in the program. We, we really look at the families that are demanding it. Um, as you know, the, the program started in 2013. There was then a legal cloud over the program. It went all the way to the North Carolina Supreme Court where ultimately the Supreme Court ruled it constitutional. Families really won that day because they now had some assurance that the program was going to move forward. It was going to be there for them. And we see uh, the, the latest data shows us that nearly 24,000 families are seeking the Opportunity Scholarship. So the demand is there across the state. And the legislature and the visionary, uh, the vision of the legislators at the General Assembly this past year really looked at that demand and put into place forward funding for that program. So over the next 10 years, uh, each year we'll, we'll receive more and more funding for the program to the, the tune of 145 million uh, over the next decade. So we expect that 36,000 families will be able to take advantage of this program moving forward. And that's incredible. We don't wanna see families 
sitting on a wait list, hoping and praying that they're gonna get an opportunity to go to the school that best fits them, we now know that more families are going to be able to take advantage of that program. And I can speak to one of the, the weaknesses is, although those are great numbers, we know that not everyone is aware of the program. We conducted a poll this summer of African Americans across the state, and what we found was that over half of them were familiar with the program. So, you know, the other half wasn't familiar. However, 65% said, if I were eligible, I would apply. I would want this opportunity. So we really need to, um, on our end, educate families and let them know that these options are available to them. And we want to make sure that they are helped every step of the way to accessing private education if that's what's important for them. As a result of that, we also need to look at capacity. We know that there are nearly 90% of the 700 plus private schools across the state that are concentrated in 60 counties. So we need to look at the capacity for existing private schools to have seats for these families as they uh, enter the system, or we need to look at areas of the state that don't have private options and ensuring that there are schools for families to go to. We don't want a situation where families get a scholarship and then have nowhere to go. So we really need to address that and look at that weakness and ensure that all families really do have the options available to them. Opportunities, threats. I think one of the opportunities is really kind of directing the narrative that this is not a partisan issue. A parental school choice is not partisan. When we look at how a number of these programs came into existence, we've seen bipartisan support. If you look at the uh, public charter school expansion, um, I believe it was over 90, about 97% of the General Assembly supported that and a Democrat governor signed it into law. When you look at the Opportunity Scholarship Program, you had two Republican primary sponsors and you had two Democrat sponsors. So we really need to look at this issue as one that is really focused on families, focused on children, and it's not one that really should get mired down in the, the politics because it, it's not a partisan issue. And I think that we have the opportunity as an organization, for Parents for Educational Freedom, to be a bridge. We can, you know, on one hand, we have legislators who are making decisions, and over here we have families who want and need these programs. We as an organization can have the opportunity to be a bridge so that families have an understanding of what decisions are being made and what policy is coming out of Raleigh. But at the same time, we have an opportunity to now connect families and their voices with the legislators so that they can make decisions that truly benefit their constituents. I'll give you an example. We were in Fayetteville this fall and we had tons of families in the room. It was, it was kind of like packing people in, we're pulling out chairs because these families really wanted to get into the room with their legislators and tell their story. We actually had one legislator tell everyone, you know, I haven't always been with you on this issue. I'll just be upfront and honest, but I've heard from these families. I've heard their stories. I've seen their faces and I'm with you now. And so we can't forget that these are faces, these are families, these are people that are truly benefiting from these programs and we need to be able to connect those voices to those people in Raleigh that are making decisions on their behalf.